Good morning, everyone. Today I'm joined by Ali Mogadan, Professor of Psychology and Director of our Interdisciplinary Program in Cognitive Science. He joined our Georgetown community more than three decades ago and previously served as the Director of our Conflict Resolution Program. Ali, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Let's get started. Your, your research focuses on culture and intergroup conflict, as well as the psychology of globalization, radicalization, human rights, and terrorism. You grew up in Iran, and after studying in the United Kingdom, you returned to Iran during the spring of revolution. I'd like to start by asking about the path you've taken. How do you view psychology as a tool for engaging with the social issues we see across our world. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to say what an honor and pleasure it is to be uh, in this interview. It's wonderful for me. Um, uh, the question you asked really takes me back to my youth sure. uh, because um, I, I was born in Iran and my early years were there and then I was sent off to one of those traditional boarding schools and uh, where they caned us and did all kinds of things that are now outlawed. <laughs> and then uh, I was studying intergroup relations and conflict and um, I was also anti-Shah in my politics at that time. And uh, I was very happy when the revolution picked up steam. And in 1979, I went back to Iran with the revolution and this was really exciting. You can imagine a young man uh, just out of the psychology laboratory, having studied experimentally conflict and uh, minority rights issues. Here I was with a real revolution and the possibility that we could be moving towards democracy. And this uh, was so fantastic. I mean, it, it's like reading about the French Revolution uh, the Bastille falling, all those things. I saw the biggest prison of uh, political prisoners in Iran fall. I saw the political prisoners freed. Uh, but within a year, we had gone back to a dark dictatorship. And that experience really marked the rest of my life. And as a psychologist who had been trained rigorously to work in the laboratory, I realized this was not enough. I, I had to look outside. I, I had to look to the real world and the big problems. And one of the problems is, of course, the struggle we are having, even in the West, to move towards a better democracy. And so when I left Iran, I first went to McGill in Canada. I learned a great deal there, including how to deal with cold weather. Uh, Obviously, I didn't learn it well enough because I escaped. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was delighted to come to Georgetown. And I'm very, I've been very happy here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Now, you, you are the author of dozens of books. And in 2019, you published Threat to Democracy, The Appeal of Authoritarianism in an Age of Uncertainty. Can you talk about this book, the ideas that you explored nearly two years after its publication, what should we be paying attention to as we think about democracy and global trends toward authoritarianism? Uh, thank you for this question. That book really takes me back to 1979, the challenge of how to move human beings to better uh, democracies. But it also takes us back at least 2,500 years to Plato and Athens. Uh, and the struggle for dip political change. Uh, in this book, I explore the psychological foundations of this move to more authoritarian regimes in a number of different countries where I have researched. I researched and taught in Caracas, Venezuela. I did the same in Turkey, uh, same in Russia, all these countries where we've gone backwards. We've gone backwards. Uh, when the Soviet Union fell, I was one of those who was euphoric and, and dreaming that the Russian 
empire, as it were, would, would become democratic. And of course, I was wrong. So the question is, why is there this stumbling block? And for me, the key is the psychological citizen. And the question is, what characteristics does the psychological citizen need to have in order to be able to sustain and participate in a real democracy? And I believe it's a question that continues to challenge us in the United States. As we see in the American system, there are far too many people who actually will vote for anti-democratic leaders and sentiments. Now this, again, I try to base my analyses on empirical data from the 21st century, but I'm very aware that this question goes back to Plato. And, and we have these continuing themes in our history that we have not really uh, met successfully. Uh, the challenges remain. And so in this book, I, I've really continued a discussion. It's a footnote to a footnote of Plato, but trying to bring in empirical data. Thank you, thank you. Now, a little later this year, you will have a new book out and it's titled Shakespeare and the Experimental Psychologist. And you have described it as a truly Georgetown book. Could you share with us a little bit about this project? Uh, yes, th this I think is uh, my best contribution so far. Uh, I, and it's certainly the one that I'm, uh, I've delighted most in. And it, it's a truly Georgetown project because I don't think I could have carried this out in any other university. Uh, this book comes straight out of two courses I've taught at Georgetown, psychology of, and literature and psychology and Shakespeare. Now, for those who are non-psychologists, when they hear psychology and Shakespeare, they may think, well, that sounds fine. But for, for, for mainstream psychologists, this is terrible. <laughs> this is terrible because psychology has spent all its recent history with a chip on its shoulder saying, we're a science, we're a science, and we want to be with biology and chemistry and physics. We want to be as far away as possible from literature. <laughs> so th this is for most psychologists, not just unusual, but heresy. Uh, but at Georgetown, Fortunately for me, I've had the freedom to teach in areas that other universities don't even allow. And this has been a wonderful experience for me. Uh, I have great friends in the English department, in the government department, in other departments where uh, we can cross bridges. We can really think out of the box. Uh, now, this book psychology, uh, Shakespeare and the experimental psychologist argues that the roots of experimental psychology are to be found in early modern literature. And I demonstrate this by showing that there are experiments in Shakespeare plays. And I argue that Shakespeare was very much in the forefront of the psychology scientific revolution taking place at his time. And I argue that the link between English literature and science are thought experiments. Think of someone like Albert Einstein. Right. His entire work was thought experiments. And what is English literature? Well, you could argue that uh, Shakespeare's greatest plays are really thought experiments. And that's the link I am making. Now, in order to bridge the gap between English literature and psychology, there has to be change in not only the attitudes of psychology, but also in English literature. Uh, English literature does talk about psychology, but Freud, Jung, Adler, and psychoanalysis, they're not in tune with 21st century experimental psychology. 
a change has happened in philosophy. Now we have philosophers who are very much in tune with experimental psychology today. We have them at Georgetown. And I think the same needs to happen in English literature, where the bridge is built across experimental psychology and English literature. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We, we all in, we, we look forward to the publication of this new book later this year. So thank you. Thank now, you now, you do direct our interdisciplinary program in cognitive science. For those who may not be familiar with our, our program, can you tell us a little bit about the program? Yes, absolutely. Um, I direct the undergraduate part of the program. There is a graduate part. And I'm really thrilled to be directing this program. Uh, I'm very excited about this program. I've been directing it for a number of years now. And uh, this is how thrilled I am. I sit in every lecture of the introduction, uh, introductory course. And I learned new things every year. It's great. We bring in faculty from the law center, from the medical center, and from a main campus. These are experts in legal studies. These are experts in neuroscience, in philosophy, in biology, in linguistics, different expertise. And they all address the question of what is the mind and what is the relationship between the mind and the brain? And of course, I want to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a wonderful course because you have these 20 year old students asking questions, debating, and often they do it in a way because they are not um, limited in the way I am. They do it in a way that is uh, stepping outside the specializations and outside the disciplinary boundaries. So I find it a really exciting program and it is truly interdisciplinary. Thank you. And by the way, tomorrow uh, we have a guest speaker from uh, Dr. F Susan Fisk from um, Princeton University talking about cognition and social class. Thank you, thank you. Now you, you were recognized by our community with the 2020 Career Research Achievement Award. Mm -hmm. You also received the 2020 Harold Laswell Award by the International Society of Political Psychology, which celebrated your quote, achievement in interdisciplinary work that informs both political scientists and psychologists around the world, close quote. Can you reflect on some of the significant moments you've experienced in your career, changes you've seen in the discipline of psychology during this time? And where do you see the field going next? Thank you for that question. Um, the changes I have seen have been mostly technological and methodological. I've seen the field uh, take on fMRI and other brain scanning techniques and really become advanced in methodology. Uh, my PhD students now are so advanced in statistical techniques and methodology that they are just so superior to what we had 30, 40 years ago. What hasn't changed? I think that's also an interesting question. What hasn't changed from the days of behaviorism, from the early 20th century, what hasn't changed is the causal model. Mainstream psychology still assumes that in order to be a science, psychology must seek the causes of behavior. And Nowadays, of course, we seek the causes in the brain. We say, oh, emotions. We look at the amygdala and do brain scanning, or we look at particular neural circuits. We're looking still for the causes, or we look at environmental factors as causes. And what has not changed is mainstream psychology's search for causes and its rejection of intentionality. This for me is a huge problem because it seems to me when I look at the big world, 
ordinary people assume intentionality and some measure of free will. If we don't have free will, sin doesn't make sense. Guilt in the law courts doesn't make sense. Right. So what has changed is a lot of sophistication in methodology, and this is reflected in uh, the really um, great changes in statistical procedures and, and uh, tools we have. I edited a journal for the APA, the American Psychological Association, and I noticed that, that the, the applications, the submissions are getting more and more sophisticated. Um, but we are still stuck with this causal model. And in terms of what I would like to happen next is I would like psychology to adopt a model of human behavior not just as causal, but also as normative, as regulated by normative systems, and as including some measure of intentionality and free will. It seems to me that if we're going to train individuals to participate in democracies, the causal model can't be our explanation. It can't be somebody who does not have free will. Um, I'm reminded here of a famous, well, for me, uh, an infamous quote from uh, B.F. Skinner from his uh, novel. He attempted to write a novel called Walden Two, and 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 in it he he has this character who represents him, who says, uh, "Well, I have to reject free will. How can there be a science uh, of a being who hops capriciously about?" <laughs> you know, so yeah. so. Uh, that, to me, is the dilemma for psychology in the future. And of course, I'm trying to do something about it. I have already projects that really have focus on this uh, human behavior as causal and normative. Thank you. Well, we're so fortunate that you're engaged in that work here in our Georgetown community. I'm very grateful to you for everything that you're enabling to happen within our community and for your great leadership. As, as we close, is there a message that you'd like to share with our community? Uh, yes, I think the long term message is that uh, if we look back over the thousands of years, historically, we humans have made tremendous progress in certain areas of technology and engineering. But we have made very little progress in human relationships as yet. And we need to look at uh, the science of behavior as an important area. And we psychologists must do more to come out of our laboratories and engage with the bigger world. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And thank, thank you for, for joining, joining us in conversation. And again, thank you for your so many contributions to our Georgetown community over these these three decades. I'm grateful to you for your leadership, your teaching, and your very important scholarly work. And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya, everywhere.